Hello everyone, this is Sondego Chiang and welcome to the Truth Points. This is a blessing uh, channel which will uh, bless you with spiritual enlightenment. You're welcome to subscribe to listen to various videos that are here. Uh, we have very hot topics. We have very powerful and uh, uh, topics that are very, very much um, uh, timely for now. Uh, today, I want to discuss with you a very controversial topic, a topic that uh, most people have uh, uh, explained in different manner, but I want to expound on it, and uh, I know it will make meaning, and I think uh, using your pen and uh, maybe your notebook, you will not, if, uh, not uh, the verses and the chapters that I'm going to discuss here in. And my topic today is, did angels marry women and were there giants on the earth? Did angels marry women and were there giants on the earth? That is the question. Uh, so the book of Genesis records many astounding uh, events that took place during the first age of human history. Some believe that during uh, that time, angels came down from heaven and took women as wives. Even within the Church of God, there are some who believe that a natural relationship uh, between angelic beings and women produced a race of giants called uh, Nephilim. Uh, could this be true? Did God allow angels to mate with humans and create a race of giants? What scriptures do people use to infer such an, uh, such an event? The answer is that their bizarre tale is uh, extrapolated from a few sentences from uh, the first book of the Bible. If you read the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 to 4, it says, Now it came to pass uh, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of uh, God came in the, uh, to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who are of old, men of renown. So to understand what is uh, uh, being related in this section of scripture, several uh, questions must be answered. For example, what are the sons of God? Who are the daughters of men? Who are the mighty men of renown? Can angels marry? Were there literal giants on the earth in those days? And were they children of angels? Finally, can we trust apocryphal writings to help uh, explain the scriptures? You see, those are the, ans the, the questions that we need the answers. Now, let's start with who are the sons of God? Some have assumed that the sons of God mentioned in Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 are angels who saw the daughters of men and took wives for themselves. Such a belief comes from the fact that there are three places in the book of Job where the expression sons of God refer to angels. For example, if you read the book of Job chapter 1 verse 6 and Job chapter 2 verses 1 and I think also Job chapter 38 verse 7. We must first realize that only faithful angels are called sons of God. The angels that disobeyed God are spelled out as angels that sinned, wicked angels, or sometimes they are called demons. Demons, devils, or angels that did not keep their proper domain. I think if you read Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4, Matthew chapter 13, verse 49, also, some other verses that we can um, go to is uh, Leviticus 17, verse 7, 
uh, Mark chapter 5 verse 12 and uh, in Jude, Jude chapter 7, you call it Jude 7, Jude is just one chapter. So more importantly, importantly the fact that righteous angels are um, called sons of God does not mean that every time the Bible uses this expression, it is referring to angelic beings. Consider the following verses which are not uh, speaking about angels, but in, uh, instead refer to human. So there are verses here which does not speak of angels, but they refer to human beings. So, let's see Luke chapter 3 verse 38. In Luke chapter 3 verse 38 it says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So you see, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth. So Enosh was the son of Seth, the son of Adam, who is the son of God. Uh, also in Acts chapter number 17, verses um, 29, it says, Therefore, since we are the offsprings, offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Let us also look at uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. It says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. These scriptures clearly speak of people who are called sons of God. In addition, consider an undeniable uh, fact of our existence. Adam and Eve uh, were created by God. He breathed a spirit of life into their nostrils. If you read the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Technically speaking, uh, they are his children and every human being since uh, then are truly sons and daughters of God. The prophet Malachi was aware of this fact and wrote uh, in Malachi chapter 2 verse 10. Uh, which says, eh, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Uh, understanding that the expression sons of God can mean angels or human beings, which are uh, which once are spoken of in Genesis chapter 6, verses 2, uh, we can find that the answer is found when we consider events leading uh, up to the, the flood. A previous verse explains how descendants of Adam and Eve began to call themselves by God's name. So uh, I think that one is uh, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25 and 26. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him, also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So remember when Seth uh, was born, uh, Adam said that God has appointed another seed. So you see, so this was, then this verse is also telling us that uh, Men began to call on the name of Yahweh, the name of God. So here, uh, this verse is not speaking about people who suddenly began to worship God and uh, thus call on his name. The worship of God was already taking place. So this is evidenced by Adam and Eve's sons making an offering to God uh, in Genesis 4 and verse 3 and 4. The above verse indicates... Uh, that people began to call themselves by God, uh, by God's name. Yeah. In other words, uh, the descendants of Seth were called the sons of God. The descendants of Seth were called the sons of God. It is the men of his descendants that are spoken of in Genesis chapter 6, verses 2. These sons of God are human men who took multiple wives, all of whom they chose. But this is not the only evidence supporting the truth that is uh, 
that it was men who took many wives, not angels. So there is a fact here that we must uh, agree with, that angels cannot marry. The scripture declare that kinda reproduces its own kind. So that is Genesis chapter 1 verse 11 to 25. So if angels are to marry, then they should be producing angels. This is common knowledge and a fact of physical existence. Further, the Bible unequivocally states that angels cannot take women as wives and generate offspring. Consider what the Savior said to the Pharisees in Luke chapter 20. And we are going to read verse 34 to 36. It says, The son, sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So they are like angels. Angels don't marry. They are sons of resurrection. Uh, so those who attain those age, they will be like angels. They won't marry. That's what the Bible is telling us in Luke chapter 20, verse 34 to 36. These words explain that those who will become spirit beings will be like the angels who do not marry. Matthew also documented uh, this truth. And he wrote in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. Uh, let me read. It says, For... In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So there is no marriage. Angels don't marry. They don't have flesh and blood. They don't have that uh, desire to marry. Okay. Angels cannot marry each other and they cannot marry human beings. They, are, they also cannot reproduce through conception. You see? Uh, so angels are likely without gender. Nevertheless, dissenters claim that, uh, they claim that because Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit, his divine conception is proof that angels can reproduce in a similar way. They say that. They say that uh, Jesus was, uh, uh, Jesus' conception was divine. So they think that angels can also do the same. This argument, is under, uh, this argument is very much unfounded. Such a proposal disregards the fact that Christ's conception was unique. A one-time event. God the Father did not have a, an intercourse with Mary. Christ was conceived by the power of the Father's Spirit. The power. That same power that God used to say, let there be light. That is the same power that God used. Just because angels are spirit, spirit beings does not mean that they can do anything that God can do. Angels can only do what God allows. The scripture never indicates that God has allowed anyone to misuse the power of his Holy Spirit. In fact, those who stay from God actually lose access to it. If you read First Thessalonians 5 verse 19. Yeah. Who are the daughters of men? That's another question. The expression daughters of men is, is used by those who believe angels married women to advance another line of reasoning. Some believe that if the historical account is only speaking of men marrying uh, women, there would be no need to point out that the women were daughters of men. In other words, uh, if the sons of God and the daughters of men were both human, it would be unnecessary to state the obvious. Based on this reasoning, some conclude that the statement daughters of men indicate that those who married them were not human. However, this expression has an um, altogether different purpose. The reason the scriptures make a difference between sons of God and daughters of men comes from a seldom regarded genealogy found in the first chapters of the Bible. Of all the people that existed from Adam to Noah, there are only two genealogies mentioned, the progeny of Cain and descendants of Seth. 
But why only mention these two when dozens or even hundreds of, of other genealogies existed? The reason stems from the two ways of life that people chose to live. Cain chose to disobey God and kill this righteous brother Abel. Consequently, God cast and banished Cain. I, I think if you read uh, uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse um, 11 to 16. Genesis 4 traces uh, Cain's progeny to Lamech, who, has married, uh, who had married two wives. He had two women. The scripture indicates uh, that Lamech was wicked like his forefather Cain. Lamech murdered a man and a serving of death and was afraid of being avenged by others. In fact, uh, if you read uh, the Antiquities of Josephus or read the uh, um, Antiquities, it says that Lamech is the one who murdered a, 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 he murdered a, a person called Enoch. Notice he had mentioned and a bold threat. Look at uh, the book of Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Yeah, this seldom regarded statement indicates that Lamech not only murdered a man, he presumptuously assumed God-like authority. God had put a mark of protection on Cain to uh, assuage his fear. Of retribution and death, Lamech took it upon himself to declare his own mark of protection. This behavior indicates that uh, Lamech did not revere the eternal, and the genealogy of Cain affect, uh, reflects a lineage of wicked men who ultimately became renowned in human history. So the next verse in this chapter uh, detail the descendants of Seth. Seth uh, replaced Abel in the heart of his parents. If you read Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, the fact that Abel was a man God re, uh, replaced, uh, respected indicates that Seth revered God. He really respected God. Seth's progeny in this uh, chapter is documented unto Noah. Noah worshipped God and was later called a preacher of righteousness. If you read uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5. In fact, the ancestry of Jesus Christ recorded in the third chapter of Luke goes all the way back to Seth. This indicates that this lineage, his lineage, was composed of those who revered God. In other words, these were sons of God. So sons of God were from Seth. Though this uh, may be very much speculative, the scripture seems to indicate that the reason only two genealogies uh, are mentioned in this first chapters of the Bible is because God was documenting two groups of men that influenced uh, the course of history. One changed the history in an evil way, while the other impacted history for good. The God-fearing men uh, of Seth called on the name of Yahweh and were known as the sons of Yahweh. The opposing way of life was found in those who included daughters of men. These women gave birth to tyrants that became mighty men of renown. The long lifespan combined uh, with this widespread corruption during those times makes it uh, obvious that both of these two groups had many other sons and daughters that are not mentioned. Those not listed in the lineage of Seth would also be called sons of God. However, Many of them gave in. They gave in to their desire to have many wives and began to marry the attractive daughters of evil men, all whom they chose. This scenario may be hypothetical, but it is not without merit. The, uh, the book of Genesis indicates that um, the behavior of these sons of God led to the degradation of humanity. For this reason, the following was recorded in uh, Genesis chapter 6 from verse 2 to 5. It says, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, of all whom they chose. Then the Lord saw that the wicked of man, wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. So, God, I mean, the human's intent was very evil. Now, are giants children of uh, angels? Are giants children of angels? We want to see. We must realize that what uh, Genesis 6 verse 1 to 4 does not say. This verse does not say that giants were the children of angels. It doesn't say that. In fact, verse 4 explains that these giants existed prior to the matrimony in question. Let's see. In Genesis 6 verse 4. These were giants on the earth in those days. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, men of renown. So uh, here we find that the individuals known as giants exist, existed both before and after the sons of God came into daughters of men. The next question to be answered is, who are these giants? Who are the giants in those days? Many who called themselves sons of God began to marry women who were not of like mind. They were attractive women who did not fear God. Intermarriage with unbelievers gave rise to a corrupt society. Their progeny grew to vast numbers. The Bible indicates that uh, there were giants on the earth prior to uh, these marriages and also afterward. However, the term giants is not to be understood in the way that many assume. Most consider a giant to be like that found in the <laughs> tale of Jack and the, the, the beanstalk. In that story, a giant is an enormous human being that came from the heavens whose size is, this, uh, pro uh, I mean, it's not proportionate to the surrounding of this world. That is the same type of giant who believe, uh, who, uh, giant, those who believe that uh, angels married women, imagine, they try to imagine in their mind. You see, they feel that the giants of Genesis was uh, were a race of human hybrids that were enormously large and very powerful. This belief has led to uh, a television production called uh, Search for the Lost Giants. <laughs> in this uh, reality show two men it shows two men comp the earth for evidence of a supposed uh, lost trace of a massive human being yeah could there have actually been literal giants uh, on the earth with the supernatural powers the answer becomes clear when we examine the words the bible uses to describe these people uh, the word translated as giants in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 is the Hebrew word for nef uh, called Nephil. It is the expression which has led to has led some to call these people Nephilim. However, Nephil does not describe a human-like being of um, enormous stature, uh, I mean stature and, uh, and strength. It means a fella. That is... Um, a bully or a tyrant. If you go to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance um, of the Bible, that is H550, uh, 5303. So Nephil refers to men who are tyrants, both uh, brutal and oppressive. As you can see, this descriptive term fits perfectly with the very next verse explaining that. Uh, Explaining what God thought of these men and the societies they ruled over. Uh, if you read uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, it says, uh, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
here. Notice that God did not say that he beheld the wickedness of the angels. He considered only the wickedness of man. That was great. At that time, and, 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 and I mean, he went on to say something in Genesis chapter 6 verse 7, uh, which I'll read. It says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. God did not mention angels at this time because they did not marry daughters of men. The wicked angels had already been dealt with uh, before the creation of man. And they are now awaiting the execution, execution of their final judgment. If you read 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says that and Matthew chapter 25 verse 41. So if this were not enough evidence proving um, what the Bible means by a giant Nephil is used one other time in the scripture. If you read Numbers 13 verse 33, two frightened spies described um, describe sons of Anak as giants. Uh, yeah, that is in Numbers 13 verse 33. The giants these spies saw were not human half-breeds. Yeah, because when they were sent to go and spy there in, in Canaan, they came and said that there were sons of Anak that were giants. These were not half-breeds. So, though some of these people may have been tall and muscular, they did not uh, literally make the Israelites seem like grasshoppers in comparison. <laughs> yeah. So the spies were fearful and the exaggeration was a reflection of their fear. So this misconception caused the entire assembly to panic. God was angered by such lack of confidence and cast uh, that adult generation to die in the wilderness. If you read uh, Numbers chapter 32 and verses um, 11. So uh, another question is, was Goliath a giant? The book of Samuel describes a dual, um, I, I mean, there's a, uh, David and a star warrior of the Philistine, the Philistine army, and this one was called Goliath. So the depiction of this hidden warrior indicates that he was almost 10 feet tall. He was very tall. He is said to have worn a coat of chain, uh, a chain mail weighing 125 pounds. Uh, he carried a spear upwards of 20 feet long, and its spearhead. Uh, alone weighed 15 pounds. This is clearly abnormal, but Goliath's size is not unique. There are records in recent history of various men and women ranging from seven and a half feet to almost nine feet tall. Such statue is rare, but it's not the result of uh, spirit beings mating with humans. Abnormally sized people are the result of genetic anomalies. So were the giants, uh, were the Amorites also called giants? <laughs> Some believe that uh, the Amorites were a race of enormously sized people. Even the noted scholar Albert Barnes wrote uh, something like this. The giant sons of Anak were among the Amorites. This belief is born out of a statement God made uh, through the prophet Amos who wrote something in Amos chapter 2 verse 9 we want to see. Uh, yes, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before, before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the ox. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Yeah. Uh, so these words do not uh, literally mean that there were giant Amorite warriors that were 30 feet tall. The words God chose to use um, were an illustration. The Amorites were a physically powerful fighting force who was strong, like the word, uh, uh, like the, the wood, the wood of an uh, oak tree. They were highly regarded for their accomplishments in conquering other people. This is what the expression height of the cedars means. Because uh, if you consider another example, when God used this ex same expression to describe the nation of Assyria, I think uh, if you can read uh, the book of uh, 
Ezekiel chapter 31, verses uh, 2 to 11. Let me read. It says, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of G Egypt, and to his multitude, Who are you like in your greatness? Whom are you like in your greatness? Indeed, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon, with fine branches that shaded the forest and of high stature, and its top was among the thick boughs. Therefore its height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Its boughs were multiplied, and its branches became long because of the abundance of water as it sent them out. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have increased in height and it is it is uh, set it sets its top among the thick boughs. And its heart was lifted up in its sight. Therefore I will deliver it into the hand of the mighty one of the nations. And shall surely deal with it. I have driven it out for its wickedness. So uh, what I've read is the book of Ezekiel chapter 31 verse 2 to 11. So we have found there the Assyrian social cedar in Lebanon. So describing a people who are like cedars in an, is an illustration referring to a nation of tribe exalted because of their accomplishments. Just as cedars is uh, set apart from other trees because it grows taller than uh, uh, most, so was the nation of Assyria. However, it is possible that there were some Amorites that were abnormally sized. In fact, uh, it is believed that Og, king of Basham, was one of these individuals with a genetic anomaly in, uh, if you read Deuteronomy 3 verse 11. Therefore, the illustrative portrayal of the Amorites does not mean that they were a race of giants. If anything, there, there may have been some who are taller than uh, most just as Goliath was a star warrior of the Philistines. So you want to see uh, another thing here, the mighty men of renown. The sons who took multiple wives greatly multiplied. Their children became much like their, their, uh, their fathers and worse. In Genesis 6 verse 4, describe them as mighty men who are of old, men of renown. These terms depict powerful uh, warrior tyrants who made names for themselves through violence, war, and acts of de depravity. Uh, so that one we can uh, find in Strong's um, H1368 and H 8034. So they became leg legendary through tyranny and delusions of grandeur. At this point, uh, God saw that the heart of nearly every human being on earth, on this planet, was continually evil. The societies built by their, these renowned men were so vile that God found it necessary to destroy everyone except for Noah and his family. Uh, because of the lack of biblical uh, evidence supporting the idea that angels married women who gave birth to a race of giants, believers of this unbiblical scenario have turned to extra-biblical books as evidence for their belief. One source is a brief statement made by the renowned historian Josephus, who wrote something in his book, that is book 1, chapter 3, and, um, and uh, part 1. It, Josephus said, For many angels of God accompanied with women, and begot sons that proved unjust, and despisers of all that was good, on account of the confidence they had in their own strength, for their tradition, for the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians call giants. <laughs> okay, it must be understood that Josephus was a Jewish general and a member of the sect of the Pharisees. Uh, though he recorded uh, many events that were accurate, accurate accounts of history. What Josephus wrote about angels having sex with women was not based on a historical fact. This was a tradition of Judaism, 
born out of myth from the ancient from the ancient Greek era. The concept of sexual relationship between deities and women came from Greek myth. And the idea that angels married women was only found in uh, the Sparius book of Enoch. Holy Writ uh, does not uh, support such a view. Uh, not only is there no biblical evidence to support a supernatural race of giants, neither is there any physical evidence. After much research, notice what the National Center of Science Education wrote in uh, their book uh, called Creation Evolution Journal. This one was written by J.R. Cole in um, the issue 15, page 52 of 1985. Let's read it. It says, we have seen that there is no scientific evidence for the existence of pre-flood human giants. But, but perhaps more surprisingly, there is no support for pre-flood giants in the Bible. Either. The notion that Adam and Eve uh, and most of the people who lived before the flood grew to great sizes is nowhere stated in the Bible and can in no sense be supported by the few biblical references to various hated and feared giants. Yeah. So despite the lack of legitimate uh, information supporting a belief uh, in angelic marriages to women, some, some claim that there is an extra biblical book containing accurate information about the pre-flood age of human history. The question is, were there, were there books authored by Enoch? Children generally do not uh, enjoy true history books as much as stories of strange creatures, spaceships, and faraway places of the mind. Many adults are not much different. Therefore, some will look to ideas of men which are categorized as parious writings of those who do not know the true God. Even within God's church, there are some who have turned to studying uh, what we call pseudopigraphical pseudo works, writings that falsely claim to be authored by a true biblical character. Those are pseudopigraphical uh, uh, works. So books that claim to be written by the righteous great-grandfather of Noah have been quoted by many as credible writings. However, it must be understood that these manuscripts the manuscripts known as the book of books of uh, books or we call them books of Enoch are not legitimate sources of truth. Uh, throughout their pages you will find esoteric stories comparable only to the fables of Greek ancient Greek gods. In fact, books of Enoch repeatedly contradicted uh, they repeatedly contradict the true scripture that is the Bible. Yeah. Consider some of the subject matter found in these various writings, declaring that, um, uh, number one, heaven consists of seven levels. And number two, there are spiritual portals all around the earth from which the sun, moon, wind, and rain came into, into contact with the earth's atmosphere. Number three, there exists a holy angel named Uriel that led Enoch around heaven. <laughs> Another one is Enoch was used by God to reprimand wicked angels. And another one, there exists a, there exists a supernatural prison filled with the light of massive fires. Another one is a group of wicked angels known as the Watchers had sex with women as well as with animals and are currently incarcerated in a third level of heaven. And lastly, Many demons will be cleansed of their sin after 10,000 years of incarceration. You see, these are very, very, uh, uh, I mean, these are deception. These are not facts. So outrageous are the stories found in the supposed book of, uh, books of Enoch that some have connected the work to witchcraft. Uh, you see, one of the most respected Church of God authors had the following to say about the book of Enoch. Uh, it says like this. Let me read it. Uh, it says, 
Some have made claims that the book of Enoch should be a part of the Bible. But the so-called book of Enoch was not written by the patriarch Enoch, who lived before the Noachian flood. The book was the product of first or second century before Christ. Mystical writers, thousands of years after Enoch had died. Jude did not quote from it. Jude obtained his information directly from the Jewish tradition, which this book of Enoch also drew on. Obviously, uh, all such tradition is not correct. But the information Jude used is accurate because God had it incorporated into an inspired scripture. The book of Enoch, on the other hand, contains such unbiblical myths as angels marrying women and the fall of Adam. The spurious book of Enoch was uh, definitely not regarded as inspired by the New Testament writers. So that one is uh, the person who wrote this was uh, Abbot W. Armstrong. Uh, in his book, do we have the complete Bible in page 5? So we found that this uh, spurious uh, is the correct word uh, to describe these books of Enoch. They are a work written in the name of a famous man to foist false doctrine upon those who seek the sensational. It is blatantly obvious that these books uh, cannot be trusted and to use such writings to teach doctrines that pretend to be biblical is nothing short of heresy. Some might think that Jude quoted a supposed writing of Enoch in verse 14, but such a belief was never taught by the church of God. As Sabbat Armstrong stated, there is no genuine book that uh, was ever written by Enoch. And Jude penned words that were handed down through oral tradition. Thus, it is obvious that we cannot use various books to explain events found in the Bible. As an apostle warned, in fact, in uh, First Thessalon Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we, uh, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. So though some might claim that the books of Enoch actually complement the Bible, Paul cautioned Christ's disciples not to be moved by false writings that profess to be written by church leaders. In addition, many claim uh, many credible uh, scholars and uh, God-inspired men have concluded that the book in question was not written by the patriarch Enoch. In fact, uh, many scholars agree that the books of Enoch are products of the uh, Qumran community and cannot be trusted as authoritative. Uh, Gabriel Bacosini wrote an extensive book on this subject titled Enoch and Qum Qumran Origins, which represents the collaborative efforts of 47 specialists from 11 countries. So Bocassini summarized uh, their conclusion saying this one. Let me read it. The contributors demonstrate that the roots of the Cor uh, Qumran community are to be found in the tradition of the Enoch group rather than that of the Jerusalem priesthood. Documents like Enoch, which in Jewish eyes had always uh, remained the bizarre product of a marginal sects, detached from normative Judaism appeared now more and more irrelevant also to the many Christian scholars. So notice a few additional um, quotes from scholars regarding these books bearing the name of Enoch. If you read uh, the book of Enoch is uh, pseudepigraphical. It is pseudepigraphical work. A work that claims to be by a biblical character. Uh, so if you read, uh, that is uh, found in J.T. Milik, the book of Enoch. Um, I mean, uh, where he wrote Arama Aramaic fragments of uh, Qumran Cave 4. So uh, the materials in First Enoch range in date from 200 before Christ to uh, 50 after. 
So, pseudepigrapha is a Greek word falsely superscribed. That's the meaning. Or what we modern, uh, uh, moderns might call writing under a pen name. Writing under a pen name. So, the classification of all the testament pseudepigraph, pseudepigrapha, is a label that scholars have given to this writing. So, um, that is what is described by Greg A. Evans in his book, Non Canonical Writings and New Testament Interpretation, in page um, 22 to 23. So, the book we refer to is the Book of Enoch, an ancient composition known from two sets of versions uh, an Ethiopic one that scholars uh, identify as uh, First Enoch and as. Slavonic version that is identified as Second Enoch and which is also known as the Book of the Secrets of Enoch. Both versions of which uh, copied manu uh, manu manuscripts have been found mostly in Greek and Latin translations are based on early sources that enlarged on the short biblical mention that Enoch, the seventh patriarch after Adam, did not die because uh, at age 365, he walked with God, taken heaven wide, uh, heavenward to join the deity. Uh, that is uh, what they, uh, was written by somebody called Zechariah Sichisin in its uh, book, When Time Began. That's page 127. Both First Enoch and, Se and uh, Jubilees are unmistakably, unmistakable products of uh, Hellenistic uh, civilization. A worldview so encyclopedic that it embraced the ge geography of heaven and earth. Astronomy, metrology, medicine was no part of uh, Jewish tradition, but was familiar to educated Greeks. But attempting to emulate and surpass Greek wisdom by having an integrate, integrating divine plan for destiny, elaborated through an angelic host with which Enoch is in uh, communication through his mystical travels. We may therefore, uh, with reasonable uh, certainty, assign the composition of our text to, uh, to the period of uh, 1st to 50 AD. The author was a Jew who lived in Egypt, probably in Ex Alexandria. Uh, he belonged to the Hellenistic Judaism yeah, of this day. Of, of that day, I mean. In questions affecting the origin of the earth, sin, death, it is he allows uh, himself the most unrestricted freedom and borrows freely uh, from every quarter. Thus, Platonic, Egyptian, and uh, Zen elements are adopted in his system. So, the result is naturally syncretistic. Uh, syncretistic simply means a combination of different forms of belief. Some some believe in Christianity and again believe in paganism. So that is syncretism. Uh, so um, religious authorities caution readers against trusting the books of Enoch, and for good reason. Yeah, they have a very good reason for that. So describing that um, a pseudepigraphical work as a journey of mystical travels is accurate. The text was written from the perspective that Enoch did not die, but was taken to heaven at age 365 to join God. This alone should be sufficient evidence to recognize that the book is filled with myth, because John chapter 3 verse 13 say, tells us that no one has gone to heaven. Jesus himself stated that. So, pseudepigraphs are uh, composed of extra-biblical, mystical, religious writings of uncertain origin. They are rejected by the Church of God and uh, most other biblical authorities. We should uh, never use them in an attempt to interpret the scriptures. The anecdote uh, mentioned by Josephus also cannot be trusted, having the same scenario and likely coming from the same false source. Yeah. So the biblical evidence does not support a theory of angels marrying women. 
and begetting supernatural humans. What the scripture describes are men who call themselves sons of God, who chose to take many wives of unbelievers. Just like you, you can be called son of God because you are uh, you're saved. And then you go and take a woman who is a pagan. So we have son of God and son of man. Mm -hmm. So tyrants existed in those days and more were born who built societies that were wicked. These men laid a foundation of iniquity which ultimately caused God to destroy all human life except for eight individuals. There is not a shred of, uh, uh, of evidence indicating that angels married women and uh, spawned a race of literal giants. The evidence presented here proves otherwise. So we should know, we should rely on the facts from the scripture, not extra biblical and um, Greek mythology and uh, all this that were written. So uh, I mean the book of Enoch, the books of Enoch. So here we found this is something that uh, can clear the air of what many, many people have taught to be true. So thank you very much. May God bless you for listening to this. Subscribe and get more other uh, topics uh, because we want to say the truth the way it is from the Bible. And uh, with history, uh, we know uh, from the right history, we can get the truth. Thank you very much. May God bless you.